Okay, good morning. So uh, welcome back. I'm going to talk to you today about um, spectral lines in radio astronomy. So um, we're going to look at uh, the particular uses of spectral lines, so how spectral lines can give us more information than perhaps than just studying uh, the, the continuum radiation uh, in the radio regime. Um, we'll go through a little bit of the, the theory uh, on sort of opacity of spectral lines and relate that to what we learned previously on the radiative transfer uh, lecture. Uh, a little bit about the profiles of spectral lines, which can tell us an awful lot of information. And then I'll just highlight some examples uh, towards the end. So, as I mentioned, then we've really mostly up until now just discussed continuum processes, such as the kind of free free emission thermal processes uh, from photoionized nebulae like H2 regions and planetary nebulae. Um, and then we've also seen examples of uh, non thermal continuum emission, the synchrotron process uh, from the, uh, like the radio jets uh, from active galactic nuclei. But you know, nearly all types of sources that we'll see out there in the sky also uh, generate uh, spectral lines, uh, usually as emission lines, um, because we're talking about sort of diffuse extended gas, but sometimes you can see uh, those same lines uh, in absorption against the background of a, of a strong continuum. Um, so that's what we're gonna look at. Uh, here, just to get us in the mood, uh, an example of a radio spectrum. So this is where we're, you know, um, taking the, the frequency band that we're observing in the radio and dividing it up into lots of small frequency channels. So this is exactly what you do in, in spectroscopy. Um, so you're looking at uh, small chunks of, of, of frequency space uh, so that you can then reveal uh, any emission lines spectral features on top of the continuum. So in the background here, we can see a, a sort of flat continuum. Um, but then on top of that, we can see these uh, spectral line features. Okay, and this is actually looking at the Orion Nebula uh, as we've come across a few times as our prime example of uh, an H2 region. So that's what spectral lines look like usually in the radio. So you can see the frequency here is up at uh, five gigahertz. So what could we uh, use spectral lines for? Well, um, they can certainly often give us additional or even better constraints on the physical conditions in the emission region that we're talking about. We've already had some examples of where we've used the continuum radiation to, to determine densities and temperatures of the gas that's emitting, uh, but often uh, spectral lines can can do that uh, in a better way or a different way, an independent way uh, to give us more information. Um, when you've come across spectroscopy before uh, in various uh, circumstances in the lab, for instance, then uh, you know you might think of using spectroscopy as a, as a way of determining the, uh, uh, what the composition of something, like what, what's, what's something actually made of because spectral lines are unique uh, their wavelengths and frequencies are unique to the species that is uh, emitting them. Uh, so, and you can certainly do that uh, with uh, lines in the radio regime as well. Uh, perhaps one of the most important ways of using spectral lines is actually um, to diagnose uh, the kinematics of the gas that you're looking at. Is it moving away from us, towards us? Is it rotating? Is it turbulent? Um, all of those kind of uh, global motions of the gas, uh, we can really uh, probe only with a spectral line. You get none of that information by looking at continuum uh, radiation. And towards the end, I'll, I'll also indicate that um, we, we get another handle on magnetic fields uh, in, uh, uh, through looking at spectral lines, again, especially in the, in the radio regime. So I'm just going to delve into the theory here a little bit to, um, to get us going and give you some idea of what's involved in the, uh, the study of uh, spectral lines. And a lot of this is true, you know, not just for radio uh, 
uh, spectral lines, but for radio lines throughout astrophysics. Um, so I'm setting up here uh, just to keep things simple. Uh, and often this is uh, good enough for sort of trying to understand what's going on, what we would call a two level system. So we're just looking at two levels, uh, uh, you know, quantum levels in a, could be an atom, an ion or a molecule. Um, and obviously the electron could either be in one or other of these uh, levels and we'll go up and down and depending on various types of uh, processes that can uh, either excite the electron from level one up to level two or de-excite it from level two back down to level one. Okay. So I'll just go through some of these and so they, um, they each have a, a different sort of name and a different type of process associated with them. So on the left here, I've got a group of processes that I refer to as radiative processes. So these are processes that involve photons. Okay. Um, and so the, the first one I'm looking at on the left here uh, is uh, the process of what's called spontaneous emission. So imagine that our electron is in the uh, upper level and it's in, so it's in an excited state. And like most sort of quantum states, they don't like being in a high energy state. They always want to return to a lower energy state. So basically after some time, um, the electron will spontaneously drop from level two down to level one. And in the process, it will emit a photon, which has you know, uh, an energy that is exactly the same as the energy difference between those two levels. And of course, that's then a specific frequency or wavelength and hence gives rise to a spectral line. Okay, So this process is, is the main process by which, well, it is the process really, by which we see spectral lines. Okay, So spontaneous emission. And here we have uh, kind of the opposite process. Okay, um, So this this arrow here represents the process of absorption of a photon. Okay, so a photon with exactly this amount of energy will come in, it will excite the electron from level one up to level two, the photon will be destroyed. Uh, and so that is the process of absorption. Okay. Now, there's another process involved here, which is a bit of a strange one, and will certainly be the subject of the next lecture uh, on mazes. And this is a process called stimulated emission. So that's where, again, we're in the electron is up in the upper level, the level two here, and a photon will come along with exactly this energy. Uh, and the presence of that, or the passage of that photon near the atom uh, will uh, cause the electron to drop down to level one. Okay, so there's an interaction again between the electromagnetic wave passing with the photon. And because it has exactly the same frequency as this energy difference, it causes that uh, electron to drop down to that lower level. And so this is the idea, it's called stimulated emission, because effectively that additional photon that comes along stimulates the emission of, of a second photon. So we end up with two photons, the stimulating photon is not destroyed, uh, and it, we get two photons for the price of one. So again, we'll hear a lot about that in the next lecture. So those are the radiative processes. Okay. Um, there are also collisional processes. Okay. So uh, collisions with another atom or anything uh, will uh, or can cause the electron to excite from one level up to the next. So that's called collisional excitation. Similarly, you can get collisional de-excitation. Okay. So if the atom is in an excited state, the electrons up here in an excited state, it can give that energy up during a collision to another atom and it will drop back down again. But here, the energy is going into whatever it's collided with, so you don't get a photon. So, so this process can kind of quench any spectral lines and, and stop them. And just to give a bit of notation here, so we can characterize you know, if we average over a population of these uh, atoms, then the population of level one is referred to as, as N1, and the population of level two is referred to as N2, and these are number densities again. It's the number of atoms with an electron in level one, 
per unit volume. Okay, so that sets up our sort of system for looking at the spectral lines that are going to come out of a particular transition. So when I talk about a transition, it's a transition usually from level two down to level one. So briefly, I'm just going to define those uh, letters that you could see there. These are the rates, if you like. So this is the atomic physics part of this. So there's a big interaction between atomic physics and astrophysics here. So all of these different uh, coefficients and rates are determined uh, either you know, through quantum theory or measured in the lab, you know, stud people studying atomic physics. Um, so the, um, these are uh, the radiative processes are uh, termed Einstein coefficients. So Albert popping up again here. Um, so A21 is the probability of this spontaneous uh, decay from level two to level one emitting a, emitting a photon. So that's just, you know, what's the, what's the rate per unit time that that uh, process takes place. Einstein B coefficients describe the, um, either the absorption of photon uh, up or this stimulated emission involving a photon going down. And then we have the collisional uh, coefficients. So there's a collisional excitation coefficient and a collisional de-excitation coefficient. Okay. Again, all of these measured uh, through atomic physics, either theoretically or in the lab. Okay, so let's now kind of go back, you know, a week, if you like, to when I was talking about uh, radio transfer and introduce the concept of optical depth, okay, and opacity. Um, so how does, you know, how can we write down an equation for the uh, opacity of a spectral line related to these uh, quantities that we've just uh, introduced? Um, so the, the term here that I'm just circling uh, would be the uh, opacity. So the, the kappa nu here is the term here. And so really it's, you know, basically what are the chances of a photon coming along and being absorbed, okay, by the, uh, due to uh, one of these spectral line processes. So if we just go back to the diagram, then the main absorption process is this one here where the photon gets destroyed because the electron jumps up. And that's obviously related to B12, the Einstein uh, coefficient for absorption. And so you can see that term here, okay. And <clears throat> because of the way, uh, this is defined, it's basically defined as a kind of one over intensity unit. Um, then you've got uh, the energy of the photon in, in the term here as well, as well as a four pi representing the per unit solid angle, which comes into the definition of intensity. And this uh, quantity here, phi as a function of nu, um, is what's called the, the line profile. So this is like just a normalized function, because uh, obviously, now the, uh, the opacity is going to be a st very strong function of frequency as we go through the spectral line, which has a particular, you know, has its opacity at the peak of the center of the, of the line. And as we go off either side in frequency, get further away from line center uh, into the wings of the line, the opacity will drop uh, quite sharply. So that is described by this profile, uh, line profile function here. And so there's a little added complication in here, which is to correct, if you like, for this uh, kind of uh, related process of stimulated emission. But of course, this is an emission process, not an absorption process. And so it appears here as a negative sign. Okay. And so it, it ends up in the uh, opacity bit of the equation, if you like, for the transfer equation rather than emissivity, even though it's an emission process it comes in here as a kind of a negative absorption process because uh, you can see that uh, the, um, the functional form makes more sense for it to come in here, okay? And it's obviously proportional to the uh, 
the starting point, which is the population in the level two, the upper level, not the lower level. Okay, we'll come back to this expression a little bit later. So that is our general expression for the opacity uh, of a line. So one thing that you can see straight away from that kind of formula is that the optical depth of the line itself, as opposed to the surrounding continuum, uh, is mainly going to be proportional to n1. Okay, so if we just go back, okay, so for a given line, you know, these things are fairly fixed. Obviously, the, the b's are just constants. And so we can see that the optical depth is going to be proportional to n1 mainly. So a point I'll make again in a moment is that in most sort of thermal conditions, the population in N2 is much less than it is in N1 and usually can be related to N1 anyway because of the temperature if we're under normal sort of thermal uh, equilibrium type conditions. And so, you know, if we kind of ignore that term for the moment, then you can see that the optical depth is going to be proportional to, to N1. And in a similar way, again, especially if we're under sort of normal thermal equilibrium type conditions, the population in any kind of given level, you can relate it to the total population of that species, whether it's an atom or an ion or a molecule. And so therefore you can relate it to the total number density, N. Therefore, the total optical depth will be uh, proportional to the integral of n ds, where s is a is a path length again through you know, whatever medium uh, we're talking about, the, the emitting region. Okay, and so we refer to this quantity, the integral of n ds, uh, as capital N, and a capital N is referred to as a column density. Okay, and you can see, you know, the number density will have. Uh, units of per meter cubed because it's the number of particles per unit volume. Um, but here we're integrating over a, over a length and so the units of column density are going to be per meter squared. Okay, So you can think of a column density as you know you're looking along a line of sight and you're adding up all the material along that line of sight so it becomes like a per unit area uh, type of uh, you know how much material have you got per unit area on the sky, okay? But it's integrated up along the line of sight. And we'll see that, you know, this therefore becomes quite a useful quantity uh, because this is, you know, often what we get from observations is that we end up deriving uh, column densities from spectral line observations. And just as a way to illustrate that, um, here is a, a column density map. If you look on the axis here, um, you can see that this is called a column density. And it's, as usual in CGS units, it's got units of per centimeter squared rather than per meter squared, because that's what astronomers like to do. And this has been derived from a spectral line of a certain molecule, the carbon monoxide molecule. Uh, you'll, you'll hear more about this in the uh, star formation lecture. Um, it's a very common molecule, which has a very easily studied spectral line uh, up at around uh, 100 gigahertz. Uh, so more in the millimeter than the radio, but similar principles. Okay, And you can see in this black and white picture here um, that the column density map is kind of you know, mapping out where there's a lot of that particular mole molecular line emission along the line of sight. It looks very uh, filamentary. Quite structured. This is very typical of the molecular uh, molecular clouds out there in the interstellar medium uh, and the denser parts in here where you have a high column density um, are likely to be where new stars are in the process of forming. So you heard me there already say oh you know these are denser parts of the uh, of the cloud and yet we're only really I'm only showing you here the column density. Okay. So um, as way of a first bit of a discussion, um, well, during a little short break, um, 
have a little think about, you know, what kind of assumptions are you going to need to make in order to make an estimate of the, the number density, which is the, you know, the physical property we'd really want to get hold of, the number of particles per meter cube per unit volume, from measurements of this quantity, the column density, uh, which is just per meter squared. So, you know, perhaps in the context of, of this uh, kind of image, maybe perhaps, you know, have a think about, you know, how could we turn uh, this kind of column density map into something where we could estimate, uh, estimate the number density, uh, volume number density in certain regions under certain assumptions. Okay, so I'll leave you to have a little think about that for five minutes and then we'll come back and continue. Mm.